Amen. Well, I just want to remind you, tonight, 6 o'clock, Mishler, doors open at 5. Should be a great time. And um, it's just a good thing what's happening in the city. Amen. You know, anytime God's people are willing to work together, it is a wonderful thing. All right. Let me take you this morning to the book of Revelation. We're going to begin there, and then we're going to end up in Genesis and get back to Revelation. We're going to preach the whole Bible in a little bit of time. How would that be? All right? Saying, yeah, I want to see that happen. Right? That, you know, you know us, us pastors, you know, sometimes I just want you to know, you know, you need to pray for us, you know, because we're used to getting harassed, okay? But, like, let me, let me this is the text I get last night from my son-in-law. My son-in-law, I gave him my daughter, and he's still alive. And at, nine, at 10 o'clock last night, I get a text. You have a 20-minute time limit to speak tomorrow. To which I just promptly ignored him till this morning. Then I asked him why. He said, because we have Sunday school tomorrow. So I'm going to tell you right now that this is going to be the longest message in the history of the world. All right? And you can blame Eric Mercer for it. Amen? You know, um, as you know, we've been a part of this citywide sermon series for the past number of weeks. Um, again, I uh, encourage you to go tonight. The theme for today, the last of these series, is sending. All right? Now, when people hear this word, they instantly think of those sent into full-time ministry or those who might... Think of church planners and missionaries and missionaries to the U.S. and across the world. And all that's true, all right? And I would suggest it's right, but I also would suggest it's incomplete, all right? If we think that the only sending capacity is full-time vocational ministry, it's an incomplete perspective. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. And so I'm going to speak to you today, a message that God gave me two weeks ago on a Saturday night prior to speaking at the Tabernacle in Buffalo, New York. Um, it's kind of funny, as you want, as a pastor sometimes to be a guest speaker, you have hundreds, literally hundreds of messages that you have at your repertoire because of all the times that you preach. And you figure, well, I'll just pray and see which one of those the Lord might want to use until the night before. He messes with you and gives you a whole brand new sermon, all right, <laughs> which is what he did that day. And I began to, he began to give me this. So I'm, I, I'm going to take you on this journey for a moment today and share with you a message. If I can make you a promise today, I'm going to make you a promise that if you grasp today's message and if you can figure out how in your life to apply the principles that are in it, I'm going to promise you that you will live out the fullness of what was afforded to us on Calvary. How many would like to live the fullness of Calvary out? Okay, that you will live a complete life. And I would suggest to you that many of us live incomplete Christian lives. All right, and I'll show you why in a minute. I promise you a full life in Christ. Um, this message, in my opinion, humble opinion, is if you employ it, it will lead you to fulfilling the purpose of your life. How many know purpose is destiny? How many of y'all want to know what the purpose of life is? The purpose of your life is. Have you ever tried to figure it out? Destiny is fulfilling the purpose of your life. And, and so I'm going to begin with this scripture. And this is a very familiar scripture if you've been around me. That says that worthy are you, meaning Christ, to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain. I mean, you know, that happened on Calvary. And you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. All right, so right in that portion of Scripture, you find that you and I are the redeemed of the Lord. How were we redeemed? We were redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, okay? And then the next verse says, and you have made them, who's them? Those whom he redeemed by his blood. You made them to be kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. All right, now in it, I believe that you and I can see the destiny of humanity. The destiny that God has for humanity is that we would be redeemed sons of God and priests of God, all right? That we are to be kings and priests of God, priests to serve our God. Now, when I say priest this morning, what I want for some of you is to get out of your imagination the guy in the black robe and a white collar, okay? 
We're not talking about that, okay? We're talking about the priesthood that God designed in the Scripture. Now, you say, but how, how do you know that this was his the purpose and his destiny for humanity? Well, I think Revelation just showed it to us. But let me take you to the beginning of the Bible, all right? We go to the beginning of the Bible, and there's a verse in chapter 2, verse 8, that says this. Now, the Lord had planted a garden in the east in Eden, all right? Now, in this garden, he put all the trees, trees that were pleasing to the eye, good for food, in the middle was a tree of life, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, he planted this garden, and then verse 15 tells us that he took the man whom he had made from the dust of the ground and put that man in the garden he had created. All right? Now, when he put that man in that garden, I want you to see what he gave the man. He said, then he said, let's make man in our image, in our likeness. So they may roll over the fish of the sea, birds of the sky, and over the livestock, and over all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. All right, so get this. So God creates a garden. He puts everything in it. He takes the man, forms him from the ground, takes this man, says, now I want you. I'm going to put you in this garden. And when I put you in this garden, this is what you're going to have. You're going to be in my image. You're going to have my authority. And you're going to have dominion. And I'm going to give you a mandate for which you are to fulfill, which is to fill the earth, subdue it, roll over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, and every living creature. And then he says, and I have given you everything that you need. Now, so here was Adam. How many know we know him as Adam? Luke chapter 3's genealogy ends like this. Adam, the son of God. So Adam, at the beginning of creation, was referred to as the son of God. I would suggest to you this morning, and just stick with me for just a moment, that God created a garden which I can suggest to you at least allegorically, not, not literally, but at least allegorically, that this garden was a type of a temple that God created for the, for, where he put the man to serve him, to worship him, to sacrifice for him, to represent him, and he put him in this garden. And I would suggest to you this morning that Adam was the first priest, priestly son, created by God to minister inside of this temple, inside of this tabernacle that we call the garden. All right? I can, are you with me so far? All right? And so we look at this. And to be that priest, he gave him his image. He gave him God the authority. He gave him dominion. And he gave him a mandate. And he gave him provisions. Now, the thing about it is, is this, this Adam, the son of God, who was the priest of God, would live the fullness of this out in radical submission to God. Let me say this to you this morning. It is impossible to live the fullness of God without radical submission to God. He says to him, everything in the garden is yours. Don't eat from that tree. Don't eat from that tree. Radical submission, radical obedience, radical submission to God would allow man to fulfill the destiny for which God created him. But that didn't happen. You see, Adam was to be God's presentation of himself, that he would intercede between creation and God. He was an intermediary who would intervene in the affairs of creation. You see, the destiny of men was determined in the heart of God at creation. I mean, when I read the creation account, I see my purpose. I see my destiny. I see what was to be our destiny, right? I was to be this intermediary. And in this temple, he would worship and he would serve. And this destiny. But the problem was, here's the problem. That even though the destiny of man was determined in the heart of God at creation, that destiny was delayed through the sin of man in the garden. Right? Because now all of a sudden came that fateful day, came that moment when the enemy of God became the enemy of man and came into the garden and tempted them to eat from the very tree that God said, don't you eat from. That day, the enemy was trying to destroy the destiny of man. How many of you know that he wars against you on a daily basis to come against the destiny that God has for you? Right? He goes around roaring as a lion, seeking whom he may devour. Sin would bring a delay to the destiny of men ordained by God. 
God could not allow, listen to me for a moment. Satan came to tempt man. Satan got to that place because he rebelled against God in heaven and was cast out of God's presence. And now here's God's creation rebelling against him in the garden. And now God has to do the very same thing to Adam. Because how many know God cannot allow rebellion in the heart of his people to go unchecked? Fathers in the house, how many know you cannot let rebellion go unchecked in the heart of your children? All right? Man had disqualified himself. Sin had caused a separation. It had caused a rift. It caused a delay in this destiny of man to be God's perfect priestly son on the face of the earth. And so now God drove them out of that garden. God drove them out of this earthly temple. He drove them out of this place where he would have unique fellowship with man, right? But here's the, here's, here's the good news about this. You see, the hope of the garden is that the destiny was delayed but not destroyed. Let me tell you what the hope of Calvary is, that you and I can have a destiny designed by God that might have been delayed through our own choices or the actions of others, but I'm gonna tell you something about my God. He is a good God, and my destiny is not destroyed as long as I have breath in my lungs. As long as I got breath in my lungs, my destiny is not destroyed. God, in Genesis chapter three, what does he say? He said, the serpent's gonna strike your heel, but what? He's gonna crush his head. Come on. It might be delayed, but it was not destroyed. And I'm gonna stop here for a moment this morning and I wanna to say to some people in this place, your destiny is not destroyed. Stop believing a lie. Stop believing a lie. You might have done this, you might have done that, you might have messed this up, you might have messed that up. Well, let me give you the words of Dina. Suck it up, buttercup. I added buttercup. Some of the most spiritual word counsel I've given people is suck it up. Suck it up, buttercup. Let's see what God does. Come on. Your, de your destiny is not destroyed. You're breathing. You're breathing. You're walking. You're talking. And so from that moment, God put a plan of redemption in place. Right? But now this destiny, you see, so what does God do? God still wants to give a display on the earth of his priest. And so let me show you this. And so in Exodus chapter 19, he says to this group of Israelites coming out of Egypt, you will be a kingdom of priests to me. You will be a holy nation. Now, from now this point on, all right, Scripture, you will see the destiny of men was on display throughout the Old Testament in the priesthood. Think about this for a moment. He called a man named Abram from the Ur of the Chaldeans because he wanted to create a nation for himself. And from that man would come a man named Jacob, and from him would come the nation of Israel, the sons of Israel, Jacob, who would become Israel. They were to be a special people. They were to be a people who would be blessed and a people through whom the world would be blessed. These sons of Israel would be given an identity by God after coming out of Egypt. How many know Egypt for us represents living that life of sin until God delivered us by the blood of the Lamb? And now we have stepped out of Egypt. And when we step out of Egypt, how many know now we have been the redeemed of God with an identity as kings and priests? Now, watch this. So now, this nation of Israel would be a priest. And he created this group so that in the world would be this display of a people for himself. But there was a problem. Although the destiny of men was on display, it was a distorted display. It was distorted. You see, it's distorted because, how many know, it was being fulfilled by fleshly, fallen humanity. Even today, we're fleshly, fallen humanity. Thank you for the grace of God, right? And this destiny was on display, but it wasn't a perfect display. You see, it was performed by imperfect priests. The priestly function was done by imperfect people. This kingdom of priests that God said, I'm going to send you into Canaan. And when you get into that land of the polytheism, where everybody's worshiping some kind of God, fertility gods, agriculture gods, sun god, moon god, beetle gods, any kind of gods you can imagine, right? When you go in that land, you shall have no other gods before me. You worship me and me alone. No other gods, right? But what would happen? This priesthood 
of people would go into Canaan, and the next thing you see, they're worshiping Baal and Asterisk. They're worshiping all kinds of gods of the land. And I want to suggest to you today that we in America are not bailing down to Baal and Asterisk, but I would say to you that sometimes we as a church, we have bailed, we have bowed down to the God of comfort. We have bowed down to the God of apathy. We have bowed down to the God of complacency. And I'm going to tell you, God is saying, would you please wake up and worship me and me alone? I'm just telling you. We, haven't, we, we, went, they're, they're, like, we wouldn't do some things, but man, we don't see what we're bowing down to. And this group of priests would walk in disobedience. I mean, think about it. He says what? You shall not make for yourself a graven image. Hello. How many know they started making bells? They started making asterisks. They started making graven images. He, he said you shall not misuse the Lord, of your, Lord your God's name. How many know he's, not, he's talking more than a, a curse word? He's not talking just about a curse word. He's talking about the misuse of God's name. All right? He says, but honor your father and mother. We see countless times where they don't do that. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. All of this we see them doing. And yet, the priesthood was still in operation, but it was imperfect. We have glimpses of it. We have glimpses of it. Think about this. They would commit all kinds of things, imperfect priesthood. But then, until what? Until what happened? until the fullness of time. Those are five of the greatest words in the Bible. Five of the greatest words in the Bible, this is until the fullness of time. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so those that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. At the fullness of time, God sent his son. Think about this. Now, for, I just want you to get this. All of a sudden, here's what we have. We have Jesus on the scene, born of a virgin. And then at the age of 30, something happens. At the age of 30 especially, he shows up at the Jordan River one day. John the Baptist is baptizing people. Here comes Jesus, the Son of God, somebody who's never sinned, coming to be baptized. Why? What's he being baptized for? He doesn't need to repent. He has a sin. I know, I know, I know. He did it for our example. <laughs> it's a little, it's a, I'm sorry, folks, it's just a little shallow. Can we deepen our roots some? They say, uh-oh. Listen to me for just a moment. He comes to John. John says, no, 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 no. I need to be baptized by you. What does Jesus say? Permit it to be so in order to fulfill all righteousness. Permit it to be so so it fulfills all righteousness. Jesus was 30 years of age. If you go into the book of Leviticus and you study the priesthood, a young man could not become a priest until he was 30 years of age. And at 30 years of age, he had to undergo a ceremonial washing, a cleansing with water. And after he was cleansed with water, they anointed him with oil. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Uh-oh, anybody seeing a picture here? All right, anybody seen a picture that at Jesus' baptism, we see the washing and the anointing of Jesus the priest. He is getting ready to step into his earthly ministry years that we read about in the Gospels. All right, and watch this. Because remember, he goes into the water, he comes out of the water. The Holy Spirit in the form of a dove comes down and remains upon him. Cleansing, anointing, cleansing, anointing. And then at the baptism, we hear what? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Uh-oh. Because here's what happened. In Jesus, we now have a perfect display of a priestly son of God. Adam couldn't fulfill it. Nobody in the Old Testament can fulfill it. And all of a sudden, here comes Jesus sent by God to live out on earth what it looks like to be a perfect priestly son of God. Tempted, yet did not sin. Merciful and faithful high priest. Faithful to God who appointed him. One who's able to sympathize with our weakness. And we see him in the scriptures. And we see him in the gospels. And we have this perfect, incredible display. Right? And, 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 and it's amazing to watch him. The perfect display of sonship and priesthood. I only do what I see the Father doing. I only speak what I hear from the Father. 
The Father and I are one. You see, there's a place in our lives where you and I have got to come to an understanding that it's time for us as believers that we would live out the dull destiny of Calvary, which is to be redeemed sons and priests of God. That we are priestly sons of God. Many people are so comfortable living just in sonship. I just want to be redeemed. I just want to go to heaven. I'm the blood bought. I'm the born again. I'm a child of God. Yes, you are all of those. But there is a mandate and a mantle and a calling upon our lives to live it out in priestly ministry. You see, Jesus was this perfect. When you saw him, you saw God. When you heard him, you heard God. He was the perfect mediator between God and man, the perfect embodiment. And so watch what happens, right? So he is this perfect display. Watch what happens. Then he, the priest, brings himself to Calvary, and he offers himself on Calvary. And in Jesus, the delayed destiny of men, ordained by God in the garden, was now delivered back to men at Calvary. Calvary means I'm redeemed and Calvary also, as I read to you in Revelation chapter 5, that we were made to be priests to serve our God. A dual destiny. Sonship, priesthood. Sonship and priesthood. The dual destiny, here it is. As soon as I get my clicker to work. Oh, well, I'm gone now. <laughs> If it doesn't work, click it four more times. All right, the dull destiny delivered at Calvary is a destiny of sonship and priesthood. All right, listen to me. I I'm going to say this. God did not call you and save you at Calvary so you can live the rest of your life as a spoiled little spiritual brat. I love you. He did not do that so you could sit in a church and critique everything. He did it so that you would perform a priestly function in this world as a son of God, priest of God. And I will say to you this. The most miserable Christians I meet are those who don't function in priesthood because there's no outlet. They're the Dead Sea. One thing in, nothing out. In, nothing out. If I could refer this to you, I believe that sonship almost looks like it's the intimacy where we receive and the priesthood is where it comes out. The problem is we have too many people that are only living with it coming in, hanging on to get to heaven. We'll talk about that in a moment. The fullness of God's designed destiny for your life is realized when you live in sonship and priesthood. When you live in sonship and priesthood. All right? Here's what's going on. Like, uh, we're comfortable being identified as the redeemed, the saved, the sons of God. I would suggest that we need an awakening in the body of Christ that says we're more than just sons of God. We're sons of God and we're priests of God. I would suggest that our calling is to be sons of God who are the priests of God. There are many today who want to live as sons but not priests. We want to live with the blessings of sonship but not the mandate of priesthood. We want to live with the redemption of sons but we don't want to work with the reconciliation of priests. How many of we've been called to be redeemed and be reconcilers? God is looking for priestly sons to arise, sons who bear his name, sons who bear his image, sons of the Father in heaven, priests who represent him, priests who serve him, priests who serve his people. We cannot live out the fullness of sonship without the mandate of priesthood. You cannot live out the fullness of sonship without the mandate of priesthood. It can't happen. Anything, anything else is incomplete. I mean, no, you, you, you raise sons and daughters, but you don't raise sons and daughters for them to sit in your house the rest of their life. If they're still sitting in your house at 79 years of age, there's a problem. How do I do it? How do I do it? How do I live this out? Listen, there's a lot of things I can mention. And if I listed every one of them, we would be here for a long time. I'm going to give you a couple, and then maybe I'll give you some more the next time I preach. But there's three words I want to use. One is, I live it out in intercession, okay? Now, remember, when we think of intercession, we only think of prayer, intercessory prayer. Yes, that is a part of it, and that is a function. But I don't want you to get caught up in one aspect of it, just prayer. Intercession 
is mediating. Intercession is mediating between. You, you remember the scripture in, that I preached from a few weeks ago? I, I'm sure you all remember that message a few weeks ago, right? Jeremiah, Jeremiah remember he said, well, he said, listen, remember, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I've carried you. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you will prosper. That kingdom of priests living in a land that was not their own, that kingdom of priestly sons, because the sons of Israel were the sons of God, were to pray for the Lord for the city. They were to cause it to prosper, the Bible says. They were to intercede, all right? This word intercession means to mediate. And I would suggest that in the form of Jesus, we are to be intercessors, all right? Intercession is what? It's the act of bringing God to man, men, and men to God. Remember, go back to the, go back to the Bible, the Genesis, God says to Adam, here you go, I'm going to make you in my image, give you authority and give you a dominion, and I'm going to put you in the midst of my creation so that you can be my intercessor, so that you can bring my image to creation, so you can bring my authority, so I'm going to use you to intercede on my behalf in creation. All right? And, and, and what do we do? We bring men to God. We bring God to men. This intercessory role. We intercede on behalf of our cities and our villages and our friends and our our nation. All right, well, how about this one? Intervention. I live it out. I live out the fullness of priestly sons through intervention. Have you ever done an intervention with anybody? Has anybody here ever sat with somebody who was addicted or something else and you had to do an intervention? Some of you. Some of you say, I'm not committing. It's not pleasant. Usually they're quite ticked off at you. Intervention, what does that mean? It means literally to interfere with the outcome. It means to interfere with the outcome or course. It's used as an interference of a country in the affairs of another country. That we are to be interventional list, if you will. Intervention is interference. I would suggest to you this morning that Jesus interfered in the affairs of men. I would suggest that when he went to the, to, to the place, the Gadarenes, and there was a man named Legion who was possessed by all these demons, I would suggest that he intervened in the affairs of that man's life. I would suggest that he intervened in the affairs of dead man Lazarus. I would suggest this morning that he expects his body of Christ to still be interventionalist. Or did that part end at the book of Acts? that we are to intervene in the schemes of the devil. Because how many know there are schemes of the devil? That we are to interfere in order to bring a different outcome. Do you know he wants to send you to hell? Do you know he wants to take you to hell? Do you know he wants to kill you? Do you know he wants to destroy? Do you know that we're called to intervene? I would suggest that we're called to interfere in the affairs of this country or this kingdom on behalf of his kingdom. The book of Acts is full of men and women who are priestly sons who intervened and interceded in the lives of men. Peter and John go to the place of prayer. They're on their way to pray. They're going to church. There's a dude begging, wants money, wants to eat. John says, Peter says, what? I got no money. I got no silver. But I'm going to intervene in your life right now. I'm going to interfere in your life right now. What I got, I give you in the name of Jesus. Stand up and walk. And then the guy had to go get a job. He probably wasn't very happy. I don't know. Don't. <laughs> shut up, Jim. Just don't think everybody wants healed. Okay, shut up. All right, let me move on. <laughs> now, I'm not going there. Don't touch it. Phil, Philip, goes to a city, Philip goes to a city in Samaria. He preaches the gospel. He heals the sick. He heals the lame. He cast out demons. There was joy in the city. Where did joy in the city come from? Somebody who had the audacity to intervene in the affairs of a city by the power of God. Come on, man. Like, and, we, and we've reduced this to, oh, I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm so happy to be part of the family of God. You're a priest. You're a priest with a calling and a mandate upon your life. Okay, I'll be nice. You, 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 Paul, Paul's he's being followed for three days by this little slave girl who's possessed by a demon because her owners were making money off her. Finally, he's had enough. 
turns around and says, I've had enough. Set her free. I'm going to intervene in her life. Oh, you say, well, that's so many dramatic things. Really? Is it really that dramatic? Doesn't God still heal? We're not sure. Hmm, maybe that's why we don't intervene. Where did they learn this from? Jesus. He opened the blind eyes, deaf ears, mute. He intervened on behalf of the hungry and he fed them. He intervened in the affairs of Satan when he went to the cross and he defeated them and he defeated them on the cross and he disarmed the principalities and he took the keys from death. He took the keys to hell. Also, by the way, captives, follow me. We're out of here. How many know he intervened? Is it? We've got to be about this intervention. And then there's another word that I live out the fullness of this. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> intervention is interference to bring about the desired outcome of God. God has an outcome that he desires for your life, for your children's lives, for all the kids that come in here, all the kids that come here on a bus, all the kids that come on a van. He has a plan for this city. He has an outcome. And sometimes you and I have to intervene and we've got to intercede so that outcome comes about. And it means, and I'm going to tell you how we do We pray, we work, we give, we love, we spend money. Come on. You, you know, your money in your pocket is a priestly toll. It's something that you've been given by God that you would serve him and you would worship him. And we argue about whether the tithe belongs to him or not. Stop it. Stop it. All you're doing is justifying your cheap heart. <laughs> he dies on the cross. We're worried about whether we should give 10% or not. People are getting their heads cut off by ISIS, and we're complaining and we're fighting about whether we should give 10% or not. Well, Sri Lanka, they're taking pastors out and killing people in the church, and we're worried about whether or not we're going to give our 10%. We should be giving 20, 30, 40%. Okay. Let me be nice now. You hear what I'm saying? Just hear my heart. You see, but this other word, and I don't have an I word for it. Peter gave me one the other day, but it was way too big and long. <laughs> it was, I live out the fullness of this priestly son through holiness. You see, God said, you're going to be a kingdom and priest in a holy nation. How do I live out that holiness? What does it look like? Holiness is not, i got to live a certain way to get God to approve of me, to get God to accept me, to show God how good I am. All right? Holiness is living the culture of heaven in the culture of this world that reveals the God of heaven. That I live holy, holiness, how many know holiness is countercultural to this world? And counterculturalism will reveal the God of heaven. That I don't have to lie to get ahead. I don't have to cheat to get ahead. I don't have to sleep around to get satisfaction. I don't have to this, this, or this. You see, when that group of kingdom priests would go into Canaan and they'd only worship God, they would honor their father and mother, they would keep his Sabbath holy. When they did all those things, it wasn't to show God how good they were. It was to show those people living in that land that their crops were going to grow even though they worshiped one God. Look how good my God is. And, the, and one of the greatest mandates on, the, on, on our lives as priestly sons of God is to be a window through which the world says, that's a good God. That's a good God. That's a great God. That's an awesome God. You see, this kingdom of priests had this unique covenant. They were set apart. And it wasn't to get them into covenant. They were already in covenant. So they could show the world how good God was. You see, the problem is many of us live heaven to get to heaven. Let me say it this way. Heaven might be a destination, but destiny is realized between here and there as we live out priestly sonship. Your destiny is not heaven. Your destination might be heavenly, heaven, but your destiny is what you do and who you are between now and when you see heaven. You cannot live out the fullness of Calvary without living as a priestly son. You'll never live it out without priestly sonship. 
You'll never experience it if you only want to live as a son and you have no outlet, you have no ministry, you have no mandate, you have no calling, you have no purpose. And I'm not talking about this. Let me say this to you. This is only a platform from which I'm supposed to perform part of my priestly sonship service. Yours might be in your workplace. Yours might be somewhere else. Yours is when you go to work every day. Mine is putting up with Troy every day. Let, let, me show you, let, let me show you what it looks like. Steve, come here, man. Bring your friends. He was telling me this last week. I said, you're going to share a testimony this week. Because I want to show you what it looks like to be living out priestly sonship on a daily basis. Uh, whoa, man. Wow. Um, everybody awake now, huh? Wait, you, uh, you, you, you think they were sleeping? <laughs> That's not what I meant. <laughs> uh, sorry. All right. I, uh, I don't want to sound like I'm boasting or bragging or anything, but uh, most of you know that few months back here, I rededicated my life, and uh, it, it's, been, it's been awesome. Um, God's definitely working. And I say God's working because it's not me. It's not us as a group. But we, we really see him changing our lives, changing people around us. Um, every day. I pray that God opens our hearts and our eyes and our ears that we can hear him speak and, and see his miracles and, and just have him form us and move us in, in ways that he needs us to move. And uh, a few weeks back, and, it, and it's kind of hard to, to, it's going to be hard to explain because unless you know our work, work area, but roughly the distance between these speakers, say I work over by those speakers, my, my brother Bill here, works over by those speakers, and he actually works inside, uh, it's a welding booth, about eight, eight foot walls, and I very seldom see him throughout the day. A few weeks ago, God laid it on my heart to start a prayer group at work, and uh, Todd and I and another, you know, a few other people was attending a, a Bible study with George, and I was really excited about God working through me because I'm, I'm not educated. I, have, I mean, I have my struggles and, and whatnot, but, but God's using us. So anyhow, for about a week and a half, I just felt this, this burden. Like, I need, to, I need to start a prayer group. Finally, one, it was on a Monday. God said, I'm working on a motor, and, and, and God says, you need to start this prayer group and you're going to use Bill, and you're going to use his work area. <laughs> and it, it was clear as day, and I'm working on his motor, and I just happened to look up, and Bill's standing about 20 feet from me, standing in the alleyway, looking at me, talking to another gentleman. I'm like, all right, God, you, you got my attention. You know what I mean? It, it's too obvious. So I stopped on a door and walked over, and, and he got done talking. The other gentleman walked in. I said, Bill, I need to talk to you. I need your help. He says, uh, anything. He says, if I can help you, I will. I said, well, I know you can. I said, God laid it on my heart to start a prayer group, and I'm supposed to use you, and I'm supposed to use your welding booth. He said, let's do it. Like, no hesitation. Didn't bat an eye. Not. He was, he's in 100%. I said, give me about a week. I said, let me get some things together, gather some people up. He said, all right. I said, we'll start next Monday. About 20 minutes later, half hour later, I go in the men's room. He's in the washing his hands, and he says, "You know, we don't need to start. We don't have to wait till next week." He goes, "We can start tomorrow." I said, "All right, you're on. Let's do it tomorrow." I said, "Even if it's just you and I, we're going to start tomorrow." So I come out of the bathroom, and there's a couple of gentlemen that worked on the other side of the aisle from me. Uh, God laid on my heart to invite them. 
So I walk over and I said, hey guys, I just want to tell you we're going to start a prayer group tomorrow. You're welcome to join us if you want to. One guy's like, I'm in. He just actually just got done with a ministry school. Um, and he's, he's starting his own ministry. But uh, the other young kid I just met like a week prior to, I don't, I don't even really know him. Great guy. He's giving me the funniest looks on I said, listen, I said, I thought maybe I offended him or something. I was like, hey, you don't, I'm just inviting you. I said, you don't have to if you don't want to. He said, you don't understand. He said, my church is doing this join the city thing. He goes, me and my wife all weekend have been talking about this, and she just asked me yet last night if there's any way we can start a prayer group at work. That was last night. And you're asking me today. He goes, that's not a coincidence. I just want to point out to you how God works because God told me on Monday, you need to get this started. He had already spoke to these other people and had every, all the footwork done for me. He just used me to get the ball rolling. Now I'm going to tell you, every day since then, we have a group of guys between six and eight people. I think one time we might even have 10 get together and pray. We pray for the safety of the shop. We pray for the guys that got furloughed. We pray people that are going through divorce, sicknesses, whatever it might be. Great men, great men. And I, I can tell you, and I told them from day one, I said, it's not about me. It's not about us. We want to lift up God. We want to glorify. Everything we do, we want to glorify God. All right, this is God working. He blessed us by getting us started. He's the one that appointed us to start this. He's going to bless it. I truly believe that. He's going to use each and every one of us in a different way, however he needs us, to make us work. And I said, this is a huge shop, huge shop. I said, a small group of men. You're not going to light a house with one candle. But if you put a candle in each room, two candles in each room, three candles, it starts getting bright. How long ago did we start this? Two weeks ago? Two and a half weeks? Something like that? Three, yeah. About three. three weeks ago? We've already had people from other areas of the shop come join us. All right? This is God. God's working. I've, I've been down to railroad for 26 years. Never have I heard anybody play Christian music on their radios. I have seen a few people over the years pray, maybe, maybe half a dozen times people praying. In the past three weeks, we've prayed for people that are going for tests for cancer, that the doctor told them they had cancer. They go for tests, come back, everything's negative. All right? That's God working. Uh, My sister, Rick's sister. There's a list. Yeah, there is a, there is a list. I, I truly... And I could go on and on. I know you said this is going to be the longest sermon ever. I'm going to help you out. You really no. did. <laughs> I just, I just, I just, he, he did give me a time. But listen, I just want to tell you. His sister had struggles going on. She's doing better. His, his fiance's sister was having troubles. She's doing better. Um, there's, there's, just, there, there's a whole list of people, truly. Um, I had a guy pray for me. He's actually going for surgery, or I didn't. I prayed for them. Tuesday, he's going for surgery. All week, he's just been so stressed out. He goes, Steve, what if I can't donate it back to work in time? What if this and what if that and what if this? I said, can I pray with you? He said, yeah, please do. So I prayed with him. He, I mean, his anxiety was through the roof. And I just asked God, I said, God, please be with him and his family. Take this stress away. Let them know you're with them. Let them feel your loving arms around them. And, and we just prayed and prayed and prayed. And we got done. He was just, you could see, he was just so relaxed. He smiled. He goes, I feel better already. Praise God. I've had people, at first I started playing my Christian music. And, and, and I'm not one of them guys, I'm, I'm not going to push my beliefs on you. I'm not going to jam it down your face. But you're going to know where I stand. If you're going to sit over and play your music loud, I don't want to hear it. I'm going to listen to my music. So you may hear my music. Now there's an, I could go on and on. I used to work at one other shop and I, I if anybody knows anybody about anything about uh, unions and seniority and stuff, 
out of like 300 people, I'm like 15. So I can almost have any job in the shop that I want. Over the past two years, I've bid a couple jobs to have the jobs go to a younger guy, which everybody's like, you need to fight, you need to, you know what? It just ain't supposed to be. That happened a couple times that I didn't get jobs that I bid that I probably should have gotten. And then I was at one end of the shop. Two, about two months ago, I bid a job and I got it. So I just started this job working there, Bill, about two months ago. And I got thinking the other day, I'm like, you know how crazy this is? I'm dead center in the middle of the shop. God had a plan. God had a plan. And, I, and you're not gonna tell me any different. But anyway, I play my music, and at first I got all kinds of people ridiculing me. All kinds of, what are you listening to, blah, blah. You know what? My salvation is not through you. I'm not ashamed of my father. I'm gonna worship him all day, every day. That's who I am. Not only, not only has the ridicule stopped, I have people coming over requesting songs. People driving by, stopping their buggy, their maintenance buggies or whatever, say, is that casting crowns? You know, where there's light, darkness cannot re exist. It's not gonna happen. We're slowly, the light's slowly gonna spread through the shop. I wanna praise God. I wanna praise my brothers for being so faithful, stepping out and uh, being supportive. There, there's about, there's other guys I asked to come here and they couldn't, because they're really involved with their church and uh, they, they couldn't make it this morning, but these guys are awesome. Like I said, it's, but it's not about us. It's God and our leadership. Every, every day we thank God for this church. All you guys are church family, our leadership. George, Jim, Troy, all you guys are awesome. I love you guys. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, I love you. Thank you. He'll, he'll make a fine preacher. He can't stick to the time limit either. <laughs> you just can't help it when you're excited about something. Come on, Troy. You know... As Troy comes, let me close with this. You just heard this testimony. That is a priestly son in his workplace, which is his temple, if you will. That is being used in an intercessory, interventionist role so that people can see God. Skip, they're having prayer services in Norfolk Southern down at the yard. It's an awesome thing. You, you see, let me say this to you. What do I want for you today? I want you to understand what Calvary afforded you. Yes, sonship. Yes, salvation. But there is a mandate and there is a calling to live as priestly sons of God. That that would be discovered as priestly sons of God. Jesus, you know, we, we, this sending theme, Troy. You know, God created Adam and sent him into the garden. This is what I want you to do there. And, and then we see him send the nation of Israel over and over again. And, and then he sent his son, right? He sends his son at the fullness of time. And, and then the, Jesus looks at his disciples and he says to them, what? Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I send you. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And went and go, they did. Right? They went out as priestly sons of God. This is not just a message and a catchy phrase. This is a calling and a mandate upon our lives. It is an identity. You can walk in the fullness of identity and fullness of calling. The fullness of identity and the fullness of mandate. The fullness of identity and the fullness of a mantle that he has put upon us. Anything else is, less, is, is incomplete. Anything else is incomplete. And those men he sent, those women he sent, they changed lives, they changed cities, they changed regions, they changed history. 
And I would say today that he looks at his priestly sons and he says, so send I you. So send I you. I sent you the day I created you in your mother's womb and I put you upon the face of the earth for such a time as this to live out the fullness of your calling and to live out the fullness of your identity. That's why you are alive. That's why you're breathing. So you can live as a priestly son of God. Father, I pray this morning that this would resonate in our heart, that this would resonate deeply within us. That, that deep within us, we would move beyond, I, and I don't mean it to sound disparaging because it's not. Thank God we're the children of yours. We're sons of God, daughters of God. We're the redeemed. We're all of those things. But oh, Father, let us capture the priesthood side of this. That we would understand that in your image, we are the priestly sons of God. In Jesus' name, amen.